Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. My name is Akash Deep Kamra, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you for joining us for this fourth presentation in the Long Range Colloquium organized by the Virtual Science Forum. A quick introduction, if this is your first time joining us, the Virtual Science Forum is an open, collaborative, and voluntary run initiative to facilitate online scientific events. We welcome your help in this effort. Please join our group, organize a session, or suggest speakers. Further information is available on our web page, which I'm going to send some links now. There you go. And uh, before we get started, our next colloquium is on June 10th uh, by Klaus Mulmer of Aarhus University. We'd also like to acknowledge the institution's support in this effort, particularly from the Delft University of Technology and Indiana University Bloomington. And a quick note on the question and answers. The questions are welcome during the talk, uh, but you have to use the raise your hand option in the participant panel, which you can find at the bottom of the screens. I will then let uh, the speaker, Nicola, know that there's a question and we can, I can unmute you and you can ask your question live. All right, so let's get started with today's colloquium. It's a pleasure and honor to introduce to the speaker, Nicola Spalding. She is the professor of materials theory at ETH Zurich. She is best known for her development of the class of materials known as multiferroids, which combine simultaneous ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity, for which she received the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award, among many others. She's a passionate science educator, coordinator of her department's curriculum revision project, the Material Scientist 2030, who is she, and holder of the ETH Golden Owl Award for Excellence in Teaching. Her society memberships include Fellow of the Royal Society, member of the National Academy of Engineering and Principal Clarinet of Orchestra at Center Musicale Series. <laughs> when not trying to make a room temperature superconductor, she can often be found skiing or climbing in the Alps. So we are really looking forward to your talk, Nicola. Please go ahead, share your screen, and let's get started. So thank you very much, Akash, and thank you all for um, joining me this evening, sharing your evening or your lunchtime or your breakfast, whatever it is with me. I think there's not really much good that can come out of a pandemic, but perhaps a little bit this kind of democratization of science, at least among those people in the world who have a broadband internet connection is certainly one, one good outcome. So this picture shows the, sorry, I'm playing with my laser pointer, shows, um, the, a piezo force microscopy image of the ferroelectric domain structure. So these are the opposite orientations of the electric dipoles. So black could be dipole pointing out of the page, white dipole pointing into the page. Um, of a, a rather unusual but quite popular ferroelectric material, yttrium manganite. And it's embedded in a picture of the cosmic microwave background from the Hubble Space Telescope. And over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to explain to you the connection between these two properties, between the ferroelectric domain structure in a ferroelectric material and the cosmic mic microwave background. But first I want to start with a quiz. So one of these pictures shows a simulation of, let me just go back one slide, a simulation of the intersection points between these ferroelectric domains, between the opposite orientations of the electric dipoles. So these look like points, the intersections between the black and white regions on this picture, but this is because it's a, it's a um, cross section. In fact, they're one dimensional lines, they're one dimensional strings. So one of these pictures is a simulation of those one dimensional intersections between the electric dipoles. And the other picture is a simulation of the formation of so-called cosmic strings which are textures that are proposed to have formed out of the primordial vacuum very soon after the Big Bang. And I want you to take a look at these and think about which is which. And you get to vote, if I can. Uh, launch the poll. So you get to choose, I'll give you like 30 seconds, whether you think the cosmic strings are on the left and the multiferroic, the ferroelectric domains are on the right, or you think the cosmic strings are on the right and the ferroelectric domain, domains are on the left.
Interesting. Can you guys see the results or not? I think you have to share it afterwards. Okay. When you end after you end polling. Okay, let me end it and show you. It's very interesting. So there's a slight preference for, can you see it or not? Or share results maybe. A slight preference for cosmic strings on the left, um, but no, it's not so far from not so far from 50-50. Let's try again. Um, and I'm gonna give you a third option. So now you have to choose between cosmic strings on the left, cosmic strings on the right, or it's not possible to tell the difference. Oh, I have to launch the poll. Again, you get 30 seconds to make your choice. Okay, this is even more interesting. Another 15 seconds. It would be interesting if you could see what other people were voting for to see if you would change your mind. So let me show you what um, people have agreed on for this one. So most of you um, said it's not possible to tell the difference. There's still, still some people that had an opinion, which is interesting to me because it's actually not possible to tell the difference. These two simulations, the simulation of the formation of the domain intersections between the ferroelectric domains and the simulation of the formation of the cosmic strings are actually both simul simulations of the same thing. And it's this property, the fact that, um, I'm gonna get rid of the poles now, the fact that the underlying physics, the energy surface for both of these um, behaviors is described by the same underlying um, symmetry and underlying physics is going to allow us to use one to study the other. So the goal of this talk then is to show you how we're gonna use a ferroelectric material in the lab to study the proposed processes for cosmic string formation in the early universe, exploiting the fact that the underlying description, the underlying physics of the, um, of the process in both cases is, is the same. So let me start then with, um, with a disclaimer actually, which is I'm a material scientist and I'm going to try to tell you um, what a material scientist, how our material scientist understands the basics of cosmology. So please, uh, I, uh, apologies to all real cosmologists and feel free to correct me in the chat. I can't see it, so I won't feel, um, feel offended. So a how a material scientist understands cosmology is that a long time ago, about 14 billion years, there was a big bang where things started. And then there was a little bit of time when Really, nobody really knows at all what's, what's, what's going on. And then as time evolved and the universe expanded, the temperature cooled, the energy lowered, then there are many proposals of, of, of many events that happened in, in the early universe. So this is a, a picture um, from the particle data group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. As time evolved from the Big Bang to today, as the temperature cooled and the energy lowered. And we don't need to look at all of, all of this, this picture, lots of things are going on. What we want to recognize is that each of these lines, each of the lines crossing the expanding universe is proposed as a proposed symmetry lowering phase transition. So the universe started off in some higher symmetry state and it lowered its symmetry as it expanded and cooled. And our focus today is gonna to be in particular on this transition here, which happened very soon after the Big Bang, about 10 to the minus 37 seconds, called the grand unification transition. And this was a particularly important transition because the spontaneous symmetry lowering associated with this transition is proposed to be the origin, or in one model of um, early universe cosmology, proposed to be the origin of all this stuff, these quarks and bosons and, bosons and stuff. So it's obviously very important. It's how stuff arrived, around, um, emerged from nothing in the early universe. So this is um, what we would like, like to study. Before I start talking or making the cosmology analogy, I thought for the sake of the students, um, particularly the condensed matter students, I'd remind you of features of a spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition which um, I think you're more familiar with, or certainly as a materials physicist, I'm more familiar with, which is spontaneous symmetry lowering in a ferromagnetic material. 
because there's a couple of features I want to remind you of about a spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition that it's going to be important we remember before we go back to the cosmological case. So a ferromagnet, I think everybody's familiar with the, the idea that at high temperature, the magnetic moments here, I've drawn them kind of like spins as little, little circulating arrows, are disordered in the high temperature paramagnetic phase. And below some transition temperature, the Curie temperature, the spins at low temperature all, all line up. And the high temperature phase is high symmetry. This is something that like, confused me for a long time, actually. But if I sit on this spin here and I look up or I look to the left or I look down, sorry, look to the left or I look down or I look to the right, whichever way I look, I see the same thing. I see disorder. Whereas when I'm below the Curie temperature and I sit on this spin, if I look up, I see the bottom of a dipole. If I look to the right, I see the side of a dipole. So actually my state is lower symmetry below the Curie temperature. So this is the first feature of a spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition that we need to remember that it kind of obvious from the name is that it, that it lowers the symmetry. The second feature, and this is actually when we say spontaneous, what that means is that there's a choice of multiple equivalent low symmetry states. And in the simple example of a, a ferromagnet, let's say a uniaxial ferromagnet, these could be the magnetization pointing up or the magnetization pointing down. These are equivalent, they have the same energy in the absence of a magnetic field, um, and the system could choose to go into either of these with equal energy. So we often then um, would describe the phase transition in terms of its potential energy surface, and in this case the energy as a function of some order parameter, which is kind of how much the spins are lined up, is a double well. It's a maximum when the spins are not lined up at all, that's the paramagnetic state, and it lowers its energy to a minimum either for all the spins pointing down or an opposite minimum for all the spins pointing up. Okay, so this is the second feature. I guess I called this feature number one because the symmetry lowering was kind of obvious. The next feature is that there is a choice of multiple equivalent low symmetry states. Another feature which is perhaps not quite as, as obvious or is um, something that we think about as often is that associated with a symmetry lowering phase transition is the formation of defects. And here we, I've kind of made a sketch of a paramagnetic material that's approaching the Curie temperature from above. So I'm cooling it down and it's just about to reach um, being ferromagnetic. And one region of, of um, the material is starting to fluctuate into its ferromagnetic state. It's got correlated ferromagnetic region and maybe it has spin up. And another region far away also is starting to become ferromagnetic, but it could have spin down. And as I cross the Curie temperature, these regions grow into domains. And at the intersection between these two regions, I have what we know is a, a domain wall in the case of, of the ferromagnets. This is a planar defect in the uniaxial ferromagnet. So this is a defect. This, the lattice is not um, beautiful and periodic anymore. It's upset here. There's a um, discontinuity in the orientation of the spin. And it's higher energy than the surroundings, right? The low energy state is for the spins to be lined up parallel. And so this magnetic moment here is in a higher energy state because its neighbor doesn't have the right formation. So associated with symmetry lowering phase transitions then is, is the formation of defects. These are very important in conventional, um, for example, symmetry lowering phase transitions, for example, in ferromagnets. The domain walls have an associated fringing magnetic field, which allows one, for example, to store data and to be able to read back the data. This is the magnetic force microscopy image of the fringing fields at the intersection of domain walls in a, a data storage device. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the situation I think that um, I know, so many of the names I recognize as condensed matter physicists would be really, really familiar with. Let's now make the mapping to the cosmological case. Okay, so the grand unification transition then is an, again a spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition. So it's just like the paramagnetic to ferromagnetic case in a, in a magnet, except this time the system is going from being a a vacuum which is homogeneous, it's high symmetry, to a vacuum of lower symmetry. And there's one slight um, kind of technical difference um, or kind of um, slight complication compared with the uniaxial ferromagnet we just looked at, and that's that in this case, 
the energy de surface describing this transition is rather than just a double well potential, it's a Mexican hat potential. So it's a, um, the familiar form of a Mexican hat potential with high energy at the center of the hat and um, totally symmetric above the hat and then cylindrical symmetry um, in the brim of the hat and um, equal energy all the way around the brim of the hat. But still it's a high symmetry to low symmetry phase transition, this time described by a Mexican hat potential. So, this, so the phase transition proceeds as the universe expands and cools with one region of space randomly selecting some choice of angle, some choice of phase around the brim of the hat as it moves into the low symmetry state, just like some region of the ferromagnet chose to be either up or down. And then another region of the vacuum would make another choice of angle and another region, another choice of angle and so on. And then as the universe expands through the transition, these regions grow and grow and grow, and then eventually they meet. So when the universe has expanded completely through the transition, it's all in the low symmetry vacuum structure, which I've drawn as the, the gray color, where the regions with different choices of angle meet, there is a defect. It looks in this cross section like a point, but in fact, for the cylindrical symmetry breaking that we're discussing, it's actually a one dimensional defect. It's a topologically protected one dimensional defect. This was proved by Tom Kibble. And this is what we call a cosmic string. The topologically protected one dimensional defects formed as the universe is proposed to have lowered, so lowered cylindrical symmetry at the grand unification transition is proposed to have formed cosmic strings. So not so much different from domain walls because the um, symmetry of the phase transition is different. They're one dimensional lines instead of, um, instead of two dimensional planes. And they have this extra feature of topological protection, which means you can't get rid of them unless they meet together and annihilate, which is pretty difficult in, in the universe, or you go backwards through the transition, which is also not so straightforward. Okay, one more detail, and then maybe I'll pause for questions or to see if anybody um, has, um, would like some clarification. So um, the mechanism that I've discussed so far for cosmic string formation is called the Kibble mechanism. A detail or a kind of more quantitative extension was made by um, Zurek, who made a proposal for how many cosmic strings should exist. And this he proposed depends on the rate of expansion of the, of the early universe. And so if one expands slowly, then different regions of the low symmetry phase can communicate their choice of angle. So if one, one region has some angle and another region has another angle, they have time to tell their neighboring regions to adopt the same angle as themselves. So then one gets large regions of the same choice and a low density of cosmic strings as sketched on the right. Or if the universe expands very quickly, then there's not much time to communicate the choice of angle. And so one gets many smaller regions with different choices of, um, of different choices of angle and a high density of cosmic strings. And one can actually work out mathematically what, what this should look like, the, um, the size of the, um, of the domains, scales as a bunch of factors that we'll come back to this, but the important one for now is that it's one over the, the um, expansion rate. Okay. Are there any questions before I go on about um, kind of those, any objections, any, any protests, any cosmologists out there think, oh no, this is awful. Um, I don't see any raised hands, but I have a quick question. So when you say, yes, this go ahead. Okay. when you say it's a topologically protected, so usually when I think of topology, I think of a churn number, which is for magnet will be defined in terms of the magnetic texture. So what is my field, which is, in which space I will calculate the Barry curvature and so on in this case? So I'd say the topology here is really different from kind of, or at least in my head, it's different from kind of topological in insulator topology. Okay. So here mm -hmm. it's basically the symmetry, the group subgroup relationship between the high symmetry and low symmetry phase that determines whether the defect you form as you transition between them, it has this mm -hmm. feature of topological protection or not. And okay, um, in the case of a U1 symmetry lowering of a Mexican hat, then um, basically group theory tells you that this 
this um, that this um, string is topologically protected. Um, I okay. So I think it's, or at least I don't have clear in my head a connection with, with for example, topological insulators. So here I, I'd say because we're talking about a topological defect rather than the whole topology of the system. Yeah, that's a good I point. See, see. Thank you. So I don't see any further ways, Shan. So probably we can. Okay. Go ahead. So let me continue. Um, so okay. So this is a model. It's a very to a. Um, Condensed metaphysicist, it's a super creative model. It's really interesting to me that people can be so creative to come up with, um, with, with, with such models with, with so, um, you know, such limited um, data to, to generate them. And, but one, of course, one would like to know if it's correct, right? So did cosmic strings exist and how can we, how can we study them? So to study anything in, in physics, we need to have a probe that has a similar energy scale to the thing we want to study, right? And, and for the case of cosmic strings, the proposed energy scale is of the order of 10 to the 15 giga electron volts. So I, I was told an analogy that a one kilometer length of cosmic string has the same mass as the Earth. So these are extremely energetic features. They form very early in the, in the early universe. And so even with our highest energy probes, the largest hadronic colliders, we're what, 10 or 11 orders of magnitude away from being able to do, make a direct cosmic string experiment. Maybe that's a good thing. It wouldn't be so good if we were generating cosmic strings in the lab. So what can we do instead? <clears throat> so one can observe and search for features of cosmic strings in the cosmic mi microwave background. And there's very well-defined predictions of um, how these cosmic strings should show up in the cosmic microwave background. And these have not yet been observed and so there's a, a bound on the number of cosmic strings that can exist as an upper bound. Um, the other thing we can do is run computer simulations and this is the um, simulation we saw at the start that half of you thought was the um, intersection, the simulation of the intersection between ferroelectric domains. This is actually from the group of Martin Kunz in the, at the University of Geneva. And of course computer simulations can be very powerful because one has can vary the variables and look at how um, the response of the string formation um, changes to, to, to the parameters that you, that you um, input to the computer simulation. But we're going to actually follow a different approach and actually study cosmic string formation in, an, in the laboratory. And so our plan then is to first identify a material that has a symmetry lowering phase transition that's described by the same mathematics as that which is proposed for the grand unification transition. So that's the spontaneous symmetry breaking that's described by a Mexican hat potential. And then we'll do experiments on our material to answer the questions about the grand unification transition that we would like to be able to answer cosmologically. So when our material makes such a phase transition through a spontaneous symmetry breaking described by a Mexican hat potential, does it form one dimensional um, topologically protected defects? Do, that's our way of answering the question, do cosmic strings exist? Did they form as we think? So we'll check whether they follow this particular quantitative scaling, the Kibble-Zurek scaling um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. How did they evolve? In the lab, we can run our material through this transition and then wait and watch and see what it does and we can measure their properties. And this project Nicola, started actually, yes, yeah, go ahead. Could I interrupt their questions here? So yeah, let I me could... just maybe um, acknowledge sure. that this project started as the PhD thesis of um, Sinead Griffin, who's now a staff scientist at the um, Lawrence Berkeley Labs at the Molecular Foundry. And I saw she's logged on. So um, um, yeah. any protests about the start of this project can be addressed to her. Okay, go ahead with the question. Yeah, sure. So Anton, you can go ahead first. I'm not hearing. I don't know if um. Yeah, Anto yeah. I accidentally muted myself back okay. again. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just wondering, you're talking about U1 uh, symmetry breaking in condensed matter. Uh, so the 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 example that first comes to mind is just superconductivity. So, mm -hmm. so would would your would the would that be the correct thing, the correct application of this phenomenology to condensed matter? Yes. So, one um, example. Yeah, so I'm going to show you one particular example, which is a crystallographic example. We're certainly not the first people to have tried this. And, and one of the um, 
so many other attempts have been made. So vortex formation in superconductors is an example. Um, in um, superfluid helium, vortex, vortex formation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Liquid crystals, the pneumatic phase transition in liquid crystals also has the same symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, when we look in detail at um, this equation, what we'll see is that in order to have um, a measurably different density of topological defects over the experimentally accessible range of, um, of passing through the transition, it's really difficult, right? You have to, so you have to be kind of lucky with your parameters that you can oh. access, uh, you know, get across a range. Um, and the other thing is you have to ha make sure you have no other physics that will dominate. So for example, the, um, the example of liquid crystal, this is really an ideal system, but um, it's hard to get at the really fundamental underlying U1 symmetry because liquid crystals also have just like regular materials chemistry defects, which then tend to dominate often the behavior of the phase transition. Yep. So you'll be absolutely right. There's many possible um, U1 symmetry breaking systems, which would be good choices for doing this. Um, then you have to be really fortunate to be able to test this kibble Zurich scaling over a reasonable range. Mm -hmm. um, All right, thanks. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Anton. So we have another one another? from da Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, in this particular uh, theory of cosmology, what is this U1, U1 field? Is this the Higgs field? No, I don't think so. Does anybody know? I think it's not. I think it's, this is way earlier than the Higgs field, but I might be wrong. Um, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, does anybody want to shout up who may, may know if there are any cosmologists? In the, um, somebody's raised a hand who may, may know the answer. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'll... Oh, no. Hurry. Yeah. So Hari Padmanambhan, did you want to say something? No. Well, maybe type it into the chat and I'll just stop with I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If anybody yeah. doesn't, okay. you can start. Okay, <laughs> then uh, let's go ahead then. Thank so you. I continue? Okay. Yeah. So where to look for a suitable material? We want a material that's breaking, um, that has a, a spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition um, described by a Mexican hat potential. And the place that we decided to look were in the class of materials called multiferroics, which are materials that have multiple ferroic orders simultaneously in the same phase. So they have, for example, a spontaneous electric polarization. They have electric dipole moments that are switchable by an electric field. This is what we were looking at at the very start in the piezo force microscopy image was a map of these electric dipoles. They have a spontaneous magnetization that's switchable by a magnetic field, like the cartoon example that we looked at earlier, and a spontaneous deformation that's switchable by an applied stress. And they have um, combinations of these together. And so I had been interested in multiferroics for many years, actually because associated with the combined properties, for example, the combination of polarization and magnetization, are also these cross couplings that I've shown in the green arrow here, so that one can, with an electric field, control the magnetic properties, or with a magnetic field, the electrical properties. For this project, actually, that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is that associated with each of these ferroic orders is a spontaneous symmetry breaking phase transition and the formation of a defect. So we looked earlier at the example of the formation of a domain wall in a ferromagnet. Um, likewise, in a ferroelectric, the intersection between electric dipoles usually forms a domain wall. In a ferroelastic material, then one has a twin boundary between um, opposite, between different orientations of the, of the deformation. And so a, a multiferroic material then gives us many options for searching for a symmetry lowering phase transition that has the appropriate and here's the material um, that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the, rest of the talk. I'll um, we'll spend some time just doing a, a little bit of kind of normal materials chemistry. Um, so it's a material called yttrium manganite. It's a multiferroic material. It's simultaneously ferromagnetic and ferroelectric and actually antiferromagnetic. 
This is a um, crystal of yttrium manganite, quite a large crystal grown in our furnace, our image furnace in, in our laboratory at the ETH by, um, by Frank Lichtenberg. It has this, so those of you who are familiar with perovskites are probably looking at this um, chemistry and thinking, oh, this is a perovskite structure. And in fact, yttrium manganite does exist as a perovskite structure, but this is not perovskite structure. It has this rather exotic structure shown on the right here, which is called the hexagonal manganite structure. Um, not very original, it's a manganite and it's hexagonal. So it consists of layers of yttrium ions in green here, separating layers of, of trigonal bipyramidally coordinated manganese that are corner sharing. I'm going to show you some more pictures of this from other angles that will be a little easier to see, but it's very much not a perovskite structure. It's a rather beautiful, rather exotic structure. Okay, so here's maybe a little bit clearer picture of the, of the structure. This is the high temperature, high symmetry structure. If you like space groups, it's P63 over MMC. It's power electric. It's not, um, doesn't have any electric dipoles. So at high temperature, the yttrium ions are forming perfect layers, as are the manganese ions that are in the middle of the, the purple ions in the middle of these um, polyhedra. And surrounding the manganese are oxygens that are shown, shown in red. And to see the connection between the manganese, I think we have to go up here and look from the top. So here the manganese is the large purple ion surrounded by three oxygens in the plane. And there's an oxygen above the plane and another one on the back behind that you can't see. So these are the trigonal bipyramids and these are corner shared with each other. So you see that the manganese ions form a triangular lattice. They also have very interesting um, magnetic behavior as a result of this that we're not going to um, focus on that today. Today I'm just going to focus actually on the structural phase transition which um, to the ferroelectric state. Okay, so this is the crystal structure at high temperature. It's power electric. There's no spontaneous electric dipole. It has a center of inversion. The spontaneous symmetry lowering phase transition happens at around 1000 Kelvin. And what happens, two things happen at this temperature. The first thing is that the trigonal bipyramids tilt. So this oxygen on the top of this trivial bipyramid will tilt downwards and inwards. And this one tilts downwards and to the left, and this one tilts downwards and up. So they make these groups of three. They trimerize um, um, in this, this threefold tilting. And then the next ones here also tilt like this. So I've tried to sketch this here by showing these arrows, um, showing the um, tilting of these trigonal bipyramids. So that's the first thing that happens, and that lowers the symmetry to a polar space group, P63CM. A second structural distortion accompanies this one, and that's the shuffling of the yttrium ions, all relatively in the same direction, relative to the manganese oxygen layers. And so because the yttrium ions are all, cations are all three pluses, um, this introduces a, a polarization and makes the low temperature state ferroelectric. So that's the symmetry lowering phase transition then from a paraelectric to a ferroelectric um, structure. Very high temperature. It's a very robust um, low temperature structure. I want to look at in a li little bit more detail at these, these distortions, this tilting. So the first thing to notice is the tilting has three choices of origin around which it can occur. So here's the top of one of those pyramids. Let's say it trimerizes with this oxygen going this way, this one going this way, and this one going this way. So it's choosing origin alpha um, to, to trimerize around. Then origin beta, which was previously equivalent to alpha, is excluded as a trimerization center because to trimerize around beta, this oxygen would have to go up and left, and it's already used up going up and right. And likewise, origin gamma has, is not available as a trimerization center because that would require this oxygen to go up and left and it's already used up going down. So I have three possible choices of origin um, that I can choose to trimerize around. So this should give me three domains, right? I have three possible um, places I can choose, kind of like three choices of angle in the um, mixing hat potential example. There's another degree of freedom though, around each of these origins, the tilting can happen in the out direction or the in direction. And if it happens in the out direction, if the, if the 
polyhedra all tilt out, then the yttrium on top drops down to fill the space and gives me a polarization in one direction. If the polyhedra tilt in, then the yttrium in the middle gets pushed up out of the way and gives the opposite polarization. So for each of these possible tilt origins, there's two possible orientations, and this should give me six domains. And if you were looking very closely at the very first slide when we were looking at the electric dipole pattern embedded in the cosmic microwave background, you may have noticed that always I had six, one, two, three, four, five, six domains meeting together at, at the intersection point, which in three dimensions is the one dimensional string. So just by the simple kind of hand waving um, inspection of the crystal structure, I start to be able to understand this ferroelectric domain structure, which is extremely unusual. Actually, those of you who are used to looking at ferroelectric domain structure, usually they're just kind of stripes or something, maybe a tweed pattern if you're really, really exotic, but this is extremely unusual. Okay, let me, um, Maybe if you don't like waving your hands and thinking about crystal structures, let me show you mathematically what this looks like and then maybe we could have some more questions if people need more clarification. So one can also, um, instead of just thinking about where the atoms move to, um, be a bit more formal and work out the form of the potential describing that transition using symmetry analysis. And then one can calculate um, the detailed potential surface using density functional theory. And so this was work that we did um, in collaboration with Maxim Mostovoy and his group. And the free energy describing the phase transition in the hexagonal manganites looks like this, where I, won't just, I don't want to go through it in detail, but to point out that Q here, which is the primary order parameter for the transition, is the amplitude of the tilting. It's how much those polyhedra have, have, have tilted. Phi is the angle of the tilting. And I want you to notice that the angle of the tilting, I said there were three possible choices, three possible lowest energy choices, but notice that the angle comes in only at extremely low order, only as Q to the six or um, Q cubed P. And P here is the ferroelectric polarization. So the ferroelectric polarization, the electric dipoles are actually not the primary order par parameter for the transition. And this is also important because it means that they don't dominate and their electric fields don't dominate and start causing trouble at the, at the phase transition. They don't take over the physics from the kind of hidden, from the intrinsic Gibbles Zurich physics. So uh, if I actually plot, yes, Can so question? Yeah, yes, please, question. question. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, Stephen J. Watson, I'm going to unmute you, so please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So I, I guess the question you answered by this slide, so you're not breaking the U1 symmetry here in the sense that you're going to a discrete symmetry group rather than the vacuum manifold being F1. Absolutely. So, so the phase transition is described, so I wrote that down here, it's described by a Mexican hat-like potential. Mm -hmm. So at small Q, um, when the tiltings are small in the region of the phase transition, the, um, the non-U1-ness that's provided by um, this angle dependence is very negligible, I'd say. So to, it, it's, you know, this is at a thousand Kelvin length scale, and this is a really tiny, um, so if one calculates, for example, the tilting um, as a function, the, the energy of the tilting um, as a function of tilt amplitude at different angles, one simply can't see at small tilts any energy difference. So it's very, very U1-like, but absolutely, this is a discrete, it's a crystal lattice, right? So, and it's, it's um, hexagonal, so it has a six-fold symmetry. And when we get down to the ground state, then the symmetry is, is Z6. There are six minima in this, um, in this, um, uh, in this potential. So, so, this, would be, this, this, would be, so this would be the analog of surface faceting then, in crystal growth, where the symmetry breaking um, is from a preferred normal to a discrete set of distinguished minimum energy normals. I've never thought about that. That's a good question. Yeah, the, the terminology spinodal decomposition of, you know, crystals is basically using this exact same language. So yeah, I I, I think though that um so what one point though is that this Kibble-Zurich mechanism is 
different is kind of fundamentally different from spinodal composition. So I agree with you that the crossover from you oneness to discreteness, there's an analogy yeah. there. So, but so the, the, um, the control Zurich, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but that's basically controlling the rate at which you go through the second order phase transition. Exactly. Whereas, exactly. whereas what you've drawn here is already in the first order phase transition state because you have lost convexity. So, yeah, so this is the, this is the potential, um, so yeah, in a Landau theory picture, as you heat up, of course, this would turn around oh, and, at, you know, at the transition, turn up, up the other way, absolutely. So no, I realize there's two, there's two terms in which Kibble Zurich is, is uh, referenced, sorry, I was thinking of another, which is this cooling through the second order phase transition. You just mean the topologically necessary defect formation. But we're going to cool in a minute and you'll see, you'll see mm -hmm. that. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Okay. Um, There's one more. Uh, yeah. So uh, Harry, please go ahead. I'll unmute you. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, are, so are you implying that the kibble Zurich mechanism um, is a consequence purely of symmetry breaking and that the physics, the other physics is just not important um, when you compare that to what's happening in these manuals? So, so there's two things. One is um, whether this kibble zurich physics that different regions of the phase space emerge from the high symmetry um, structure with, in, this, in a second order mechanism, um, which I'd say is really the kibble zurich physics. And for, to get the same kinds of topological defects, then one has to have the same potential um, in between two systems. So one can have kibble zurich physics with a different, um, you could, one could have the kibble zurich kind of physical behavior described by a different potential, and then one would see different types of topological defects. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so um, so no, I guess I'm trying to understand if you hope to learn something about cosmology from uh, this experiment? This is a good question. So we hope to, um, we hope to show that, um, when, that when we cool our material through this phase transition, um, because it's described by a Mexican hat-like potential and there's no other behavior apart from kibble zurich behavior dominating the physics, we'll test the kibble zurich scaling laws. Right. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. It's a very, I say it's a very good open question whether um, this will teach us anything about cosmology. It will teach us whether such a phase transition is well described by kibble zurich scaling. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, we can go ahead. You're welcome. And okay, um, what else did I want to say? Okay, yeah, so maybe you're th thinking, so we could argue for um, till the cows come home or I get tired and want to go to eat my dinner about whether you one like is good enough. Uh, but to a, you know, a simple material scientist, if something differs from, from perfect u oneness on a micro electron volt scale at a thousand Kelvin, it's as far as this material is concerned, when it's at the phase transition, it thinks it's u one, I'm, I'm pretty convinced. Um, there's also apparently something I don't understand called um, accidental irrelevance or da dangerous irrelevance, apparently, that uh, maybe some of you understand, that formally one can show that for um, six-fold symmetry and higher, um, the deviation from u oneness is not important, but that I can't explain to you because I don't understand it. But I like it, I thought it's a very nice term, dangerous irrelevance. Um, there's one big advantage of the fact that we're not perfectly Mexican hat-like, um, perfectly, that we're not, we don't have a perfect Mexican hat that we're only Mexican hat like. And that's that each of these minima, if we go back, we can see this if we went back to look at the um, Lando theory, corresponds to an opposite orientation of the electric dipole. So as we cool through our transition at the phase transition region, we have U1 behavior. Down at room temperature where we want to measure, our we don't have this continuous symmetry, which would be extremely difficult to measure. There'd be no real, we just have to measure this delicate um, evolution of the phase angle of the tilting. But because of the Z6-ness, we're able to instead measure these oppositely oriented ferroelectric dipoles using standard techniques of piezo force microscopy. 
So in some ways, the fact we deviate from perfect U1 is actually in it to our advantage. So here's what one gets when one does that. I shouldn't say this is simple measurements. These are extremely um, delicate um, piezo force microscopy measurements. These were done by the former PhD student of, Martin, of Manfred Fiebig, Martin Lillianbloom. And again, you see as you um, go around one of the topological defects, the up, down, up, down, up, down, ferroelectric um, dipoles corresponding to moving around these six minima in the hat. Okay. Oh, yes, and one more point. The, of course, on, again, on the, the piezo force microscopy image is a two-dimensional um, cross-section. In three dimensions, these intersections on the surface are actually lines. And this is a simulation. It's from Thomas Lottomoso, also in Manfred Fiebig's group. This is the other simulation that half of you thought were cosmic strings at the start. Um, we would love to have a measurement of these three-dimensional strings. This would be really wonderful. And I'd be really happy to discuss later if any of you have ideas of how to measure it. At the moment, um, the only measurement we have is Martin makes the piezo force microscopy image of the surface. Then he, um, he polishes a little bit away. So he moves down in the um, material, then makes another image and then polishes a little bit away. And this is obviously rather laborious and also a bit, bit destructive. But our, um, yeah, these intersections are really our one dimensional strings. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you, um, or at least I'm gonna assert if, if you're not convinced, that the structural phase transition in yttrium manganite, then this transition from paraelectric to ferroelectric described by the Mexican hat-like potential and giving us one-dimensional domain intersections between the ferroelectric domains is an analog to the early universe grand unification transition from the high symmetry to the low symmetry vacuum that's proposed to have um, generated the cosmic string. So, can you take one more question? Yes, Is please. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to unmute you, Michael Simko, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, I just had a quick question about the measurement technique where you said you, uh, your collaborator polished it down partially and then yeah. remeasured it. Is, yeah. is it topologically protected such that it doesn't, the, the, the structure of the ferroelectric states doesn't change as it's uh, destructively lowered down? Yeah, as far as we know, um, it, it is. And, and so remember also this phase transition is up at a thousand Kelvin and we're measuring at room temperature. So I think if we were doing this, within say 10 or 20 Kelvin of the phase transition, we would worry about the fact that the strings could still migrate. And of course they're, they're protected, but they can get pushed out the edge of the sample. And if the opposite ones meet together, they can annihilate. So, um, but we're really so far away from the, uh, a, re a region where the ions are moving readily that I think it's, it's really stable. It's really, really stable. But it's a good question. I mean, you know, it's a destruct certainly a destructive technique. Okay, so, okay so then we have our analog and now we can do our measurements and look at whether this grand unification transition behaves as um, cosmologists predict. And so very quickly in the last five minutes, I shall, I shall show you this. So the, the experiment that we'd like to do on the early universe, which we can't, we'd like to expand it at different rates, cross the grand unification transition and see how many cosmic strings form in each case by different expansion rates. And this is a test of this kibble zurich scaling that I introduced earlier. And yeah, so remember we expand slowly, we get large regions with the same angle and a small number of defects. If we expand quickly, we get small regions of the same angle and a large number of defects. And so instead, we're going to cool yttrium manganite at different rates through the structural phase transition and count how many of the strings form. And this is the thing that's remark I was mentioning earlier um, when we were discussing other possible systems for doing this, um, for testing this kibble zurich scaling. These are the three most readily experimentally accessible um, cooling rates for yttrium manganite through the phase transition. One of them corresponds to just um, turning down the temperature in the furnace. One of them consisted of turning off the furnace and moving um, the sample to the coolest spot in the furnace. And the other was a method called drop cooling, which is um, a very kind of bold experimental technique, I think, and I'll direct you to Martin Lillianbloom's thesis to, um, to access that one. But you can see this, and oh, I should point out, this is the same scale bar in each case. I didn't just take this one and blow it up, although I could have done because it's self-similar. This is the same scale bar 
And you can see there's really a measurably different number of the de topological defects in, in each case. So then one has a bachelor's student go and count how many defect intersections um, one has in each case, and one can really measure the rate of the, the formation, the number of defects that form as a function of the cooling rate. And so the, um, let's actually quantify this. So um, the predicted kibble zurich scaling for um, formation of topological defects is, tells us the um, domain size, the size of the domains we should form as, um, as a function of how quickly we go through the phase transition. So let me tell you what all of these um, parameters are. So this epsilon zero is the zero temperature correlation length, which is approximated in a ferroelectric by the width of the domain wall. So this we calculated, this was calculated by um, Yu Komagai, who's now an assistant professor at U University of Tokyo. And you see it's, it's extremely narrow. So we can see the domain wall by this pattern of yttrium ions going down, down, up, down, down, up, and then down, up, up, down, up, up. And the wall is really here. It's, it's really a, just kind of an atomic plane. I didn't, I was a bit skeptical about this for some time until this was also measured. Um, using high resolution transmission electron microscopy, not, not by, by our group, but this was a really beautiful measurement, really showing that the domain wall is, is, is really a very narrow plane. Um, the zero temperature relaxation time is the zero temperature correlation length divided by this, we approximated it to be that divided by the speed of sound, which we calculated again using density functional theory. The critical exponents we just took from Monte Carlo simulations for the 3D XY model, this ratio has also subsequently been measured and it's very similar to this, this value. And the thing that we're varying, tau q here, is the transition temperature divided by the cooling rate. So we can test, we know all of these parameters and we can test the domain size as a function of cooling rate. So let me show you the answer then. This is a, a plot of the vortex density, the measured vortex density as a function of the cooling rate. The red dots are from the group of Manfred Fiebig, the data I showed you earlier, and the red stars are from the group of Seng Chong. This is actually for erbium manganite, which is very similar to, to yttrium manganite, same structure. Um, and the red line is the predicted kibble zurich scaling. And the agreement is really remarkable. Um, so the scaling is very much described by this kibble zurich like behavior. So we were very happy. Um, for a little while, but we didn't have the sense to stop there and we continued, or our colleagues continued measuring and made us actually very unhappy. So when they measured for, for different materials, which formally should have been very similar, um, all of these materials are hexagonal manganites with the same crystal structure, just a different um, cation in the intervening layers. And when they measured for high higher cooling rates, we saw two deviations, which we didn't expect. One was this turnaround at high cooling rate, this we call beyond kibble zurich or anti kibble zurich behavior. And the other is this dependence on the chemistry, which we don't also don't understand. And so this is um, now a kind of ongoing project, um, which has uh, um, been taken over by Quinton Meyer, who's um, now a, a postdoc in the group to try to understand what's, what's going on here. So we have a lot of open questions. Instead of a summary, I'm going to give you some open questions. Um, we don't know what causes the chemistry dependence. We don't know what the origin of the turnaround is. And we don't know what the physics is of this beyond kibble zurich regime. Um, we have many ideas. I'll very quickly show you my favorite one. And that's that we have, this is a plot of vortex density against cooling rate. This is calculations now for a fluctuation dominated regime, which is what we've been discussing so far, where the um, critical exponents of 0.58, so-called Ginzburg regime, to a mean field um, behavior where the critical exponents are 0.5. And I would very much like it if the anti kibble zurich behavior we're seeing is a crossover between these two types of scaling, because I think it would be very elegant. But I have no um, data to support this. This is just one of the many possibilities, and there are many possibilities for this behavior. Um, a couple of you have asked this during the, um, the talk. Is it relevant for early universe behavior? Um, I guess I'll leave that as an open question for any cosmologists in, in, the, um, in the audience and um, just share with you um, what we can say for sure, which is that multiferroics really provide the first example of 
Kibble Zurich scaling in a, in a solid state system. I put um, a little smiley face here because I, the, the mechanism, um, Kibble Zurich mechanism, we, we were able to verify, but of course, whether this is relevant for cosmic strings is still an open question. I really very much enjoyed, um, there was an article in The Economist, and it was not about our work, it was a little um, 2013, on similar um, tabletop astrophysics experiments. And I love this quote from Cliff Burgess at the Perimeter Institute. Um, Whether all this ingenuity unravels any cosmic truth is uncertain. Such experiments are nevertheless the less worth pursuing. Like tap dancing snakes, he says, the point is not that they do it well, but that they do it at all. Anyway, I hope I've um, at least convinced you that using multi and, and material science to, to try to answer questions or to address questions in other areas of physics is um, really, really a lot of fun. So I'm going to leave you with another piezo force microscopy image from, again, from the group of Manfred Fiebig, um, just because it's so incredibly beautiful. And I'll be happy to take any more questions or comments that you have. Since we can't hear applause from everyone, let me just do it for it. <laughs> for, so thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this very exciting uh, talk. So uh, you're welcome. Uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll ask. I think Daniel already has a question, and please raise your hands for more questions, uh, people. So Daniel, I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead. Maybe I'll stop sharing, then I'll be able to see you all. Okay. So. It's up to you. Maybe <laughs> Sorry, you want to. Maybe the, the picture was again. nice, and then looking at everybody else. <laughs> uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, related to uh, this material being uh, a layered material. So I assume mm -hmm. it's very anisotropic. So is there uh, any, any sign that these uh, strings actually behave in a more or less isotropic way? Or um, I could imagine that uh, it is effectively a 2D, 2D system with the strings just going perpendicularly down. Yeah, this is a really good question. And um, it's actually much less anisotropic than you would expect. So let me show you again um, this um, microscopy image. Oops, ah, I have to first share my screen, sorry. Um, share screen. Um, so um, the sketch that I showed you the sketch that I showed you of the calculation of the domain wall, we'd actually calculated the domain wall between um, polarizations that were like this, and we found it to be very narrow. Um, this image, if you look closely, is actually between polarizations, one of which is, it, it, it's separating up and down polarization like this. And um, we find these uh, also, these, these also exist uh, um, a lot. Um, another point to notice, so these um, images, are looking from, from, from the top perpendicular to the layers. But when one looks from the side, one sees um, actually rather similar images. So the anisotropy, and, and actually the density of vortices from this, this side is very similar. The anisotropy is much less than we expected. And this is, to me, is, is surprising. It, it's really surprising. I agree completely that I would have expected it to be, um, to be much more anisotropic. Um, one thing that is very interesting is, um, if I go back to this, to this, this picture maybe, um, domain walls like this that are, that are cutting perpendicular to the polarization, they create a polar discontinuity, are extremely unusual in conventional ferroelectrics because there's a divergence of the electrostatic potential at the domain wall. And here they form because of the topological protection, because the polarization emerges as a secondary order parameter. And so they lead separately to all kinds of interesting physics, like very narrow conducting channels. Um, yeah, which is a little bit of an aside. So, oh, I, so I agree completely. It's really surprising that it's actually not very anisotropic, the domain structure. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so Babak, you can go ahead. Babak, we can't hear you. You haven't unmuted or? You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you... Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for a great talk. Um, fascinating. 
Yeah, I was wondering if uh, the domains that you were showing in uh, material, um, these are sort of, uh, they have to be at a certain uh, orientation or they can, um, they can tilt around. And if they can tilt around, uh, whether you have vortex loops in the material. So um, the ferroelectricity is always perpendicular to the layers, right? So the, the up and down of the polarization is always um, perpendicular to the layers, but the strings don't have to have a particular orientation. And you, in the, certainly in the um, simulations, we see vortex loops. In the cross section, I don't think it's possible, you know, you, you, you never, so we see sometimes regions of just one domain, but I think that's just because of the way the cut is. I don't think we'd be able to see a loop when we just have a cross section, right? Okay. Um, but maybe if we, if I pull up the, um, the simulation again, let's see if we can see in this. Um, do we see any loops? Mm. Yeah, maybe there's a little loop down here. I'm not. So, oh, here's a little loop, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so they can form loops. Yeah. So and if, the simulation has periodic boundary conditions, so it's all a bit dodgy, right? If we made a bigger box, maybe there'd be more. There'd be more loops. Also. I see. So if you have, if it's possible to have vortex loops, um, I wonder if you can see those in your uh, measurements, and if not, how does it affect your counting? Yeah, so that's a, so it's a good question. So when we count, we're assuming that just, you know, the number per surface area is representative of the number per unit volume. Um, but of course, if we had a string, I don't know if you can see me, if we had a string that kind of did this and then came out again, or one that went straight out, then, you know, it wouldn't, so it's, it's not entirely um, accurate. Yeah, I see, I see. It's yeah. even on the looping, yes, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more loopy. It shouldn't affect though the scaling, right? Because it should be more or less constant. Well, maybe it would vary as a function of quench rate. Yeah, hard to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Thank you, Babak. So, uh, Stefan, please go ahead. Stefan, can you admit, uh, can you speak now? Yeah, great talk. Thanks. Uh, could you go back oh. to the um, Mexican hat with the six? The Mexican hat like. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Mexican hat like, thanks. Because there was something, there's a, there's a chat going on in the chat box, which this question uh -huh. relates to. So if you could share the screen, it's, it's the okay. one where you basically show that the. This one. Do you see there's it? A dipole, there's a dipole structure. So I think it's, there's another version of this. Yeah, the next one. The mm -hmm. next one. Yeah, so you're pointing out there's a dipole structure which alternates back and forth. Yeah. So, so I was trying to think of the, the so the discussion in the chat box was about the symmetry group of this, because in some sense you don't have a cyclic symmetry because adjacent sites are not equivalent. You have to rotate by 120 degrees. So it looked to me like this was two copies of Z, Z3. No. So um, actually, let me go back to maybe this picture. We can look at the Landau theory, but if we look at um, if we maybe look at this picture and let's say we start tilting out by alpha, around alpha. So then um, the polarization would, let's say, be plus because the yttrium is dropping down like this. And if we go round by 60 degrees, let's see if we can see it here. So I go round by 60 degrees. Um, oh, no, it's hard to see in this picture. If it, it's, it is the case if I go round by 60 degrees, I actually end up, let's say, at, at beta but going in. Okay, now maybe I see it. If I go round by 60 degrees, you see this arrow here yep. would now be going here, inward. Mm -hmm. And if I, and so I would have moved to the, if you like the next origin, but my tilting would be going in. My angle around the hat has changed by 60 degrees and my polarization is now going in the other direction. Um, so it really is Z6. It's one, it's, it, it, I could take just one of these tilt directions and rotate it continuously from zero to 360, and I map out round up, down, up, down of the polarization. 
Yeah, I guess, I guess maybe what I'm struggling with is the nature of the order parameter in your Mexican hat potential because you're indicating that the energy state is, is uh, equal, but the state of polarization is different. So the primary order parameter is, um, is the, it's two dimensional. It's the tilt, which has an amplitude and, a, and an angle. The polarization is a secondary order parameter and it okay. um, couples to the primary order parameter with, by Q cubed cosine three phi. And so as I change where phi is the angle, and so as I go, yeah. as I go around, so that, it changes. That, yeah, so that encodes what I'm saying. So the symmetry group of this uh, free energy is threefold in that auxiliary term, not sixfold. Yeah, it's sixfold in the primary order parameter. Yes, but the, glow, yeah. the, the composite uh, structure is essentially two copies of threefold symmetry. Oh. Or just a, sorry, just a threefold symmetry rather. Yeah. So, anyway, um, it just, there's a chat going in the chat box and we're trying to straighten out this. <laughs> <laughs> so I should probably have a look at the a look at the chat. So I'd always thought of this as Z six, but yeah, I mean, of these six, they're sure, sure. Um, that part, yeah, that part, yeah. So so the angle changes zero sixty in one twenty and so on. Um, so what's for sure is that the, the angle is going zero sixty one twenty as you as you go around. This is for sure, and then the polarization goes up down up down. The secondary order parameter. So I guess I'm not enough of a. Um, mathematician to know whether that has to make it two times z3 or whether it's still allowed to be z6. But, um, so, so that's so not an objection I've had before though. <laughs> Mark about the kibble Zurich. So when you, when you accelerate the rate at which you go through the phase transition, which is a second order phase transition you're rushing through, yeah. you're talking about this crossover effect. Yeah. So, so I would say that when you, when you cool sufficiently fast, you might as well call it a quench because these are the, the two regimes. The Kibble Zurich explores the effect of going through the second order phase transition, but you've got to go through slowly enough to take advantage of that. Whereas if you go too, too fast, that's essentially like a jump into the first order phase transition. And that, yeah. I, would call, that, that I would call a quench. So that crossover effect I would expect. So, um so actually, so I, I guess I'm used to the terminology of calling them all quenching or always quenching through the transition. Um, yeah, so the, the reason for saying it mathematically is yeah. the second, okay, I, I've got some mathematical remarks I can make, but maybe that's for offline. So, sorry for, yeah, sorry for interrupting. I think maybe we can have two more questions, the last two questions, so we can, move, we can discuss probably in more detail directly with yeah. Nicola separately. So okay. thank you, Stefan. I would uh, switch to, uh, maybe Alfred Song was first. So uh, Alfred, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, all right, thank you for the great talk. You're um, welcome. Uh, my, my question is, uh, I was wondering, have you or anybody else look at, for example, the dynamics of this uh, strength? For example, is it actually possible to measure how they are formed or how they merge together uh, by any means? So I can tell you what we've tried. Um, or what Martin has, has tried is kind of repeated annealing measurements, you know, so we're, so heating back up to very close below the transition temperature. So because of the topological protection, actually nothing should change. And then cooling again and re-measuring and it's, you know, to see how things change. What we do see in that, what he is seen in that case is depending on the real defect chemistry of the material. So if it's a material that we know has, for example, more um, vacancies, oxygen vacancies, so the ions are more able to diffuse, then there's a tendency to, um, for some strings to go away, for them to, re to recombine. So that's, I guess, as close as we've got to having really dynamics. I'd be really happy if anyone has any suggestions. One thing we're trying to do, like at least from the theoretical side, is to identify a material that would have a similar phase transition but closer to room temperature because it's not easy to measure it, you know, a thousand Kelvin. This would maybe help, but um, at the moment we don't have a good, a good idea. So, um, do you have any thoughts, Alfred, about how one might measure dynamics? Oh, I think you. I think the organizers might have muted you. Maybe I can unmute you. Um, All right. Yeah. So, 
uh, I guess I'm coming from a background of uh, ultrafast spectroscopy and diffraction, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking whether it's actually possible to use the laser excitation uh, to and then couple with some kind of ultrafast microscopy to, to measure these, or even measure this in the momentum space by some kind of diffraction to look at, say, the width of the peak or something. Yeah, maybe, maybe this would be ordinary. Yeah. Um, structurally, the, the string is not very different from the host, right? There's not, for example, a big strain associated with it. Um, so it would have to be maybe some kind of low, yeah, it, it would be really hard, but I'd be very happy to discuss further. If you, okay. yeah. Thank you. Let's go to the next question by Bertrand Halpin. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, a, a couple of very closely related questions. So first of all, uh, I, in, in, I gather you have done some experiments in which you've sliced away uh, layers, and I'm interested to know whether the defects uh, are oriented very uh, strictly uh, uh, or perpendicular to the uh, planes or whether they wander around a lot. Uh, certainly because you have this uh, polarization uh, which is pointed in the Z direction, I might think it's yes. hard to, 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 to shift horizontally between one polarization and another. In other words, you, you, if the polarization is in a certain direction in one layer, you'd think the next layer might not want to be in opposite direction because then you'd have a buildup of charge. So that's one question. Uh, uh, and that, of course, uh, means that there's a big difference in the um, symmetry of space uh, here. It's, it's very far from isotropic. Uh, and I guess the other very closely related remark is that I'm not sure anybody really knows what the uh, what the correct theory uh, in uh, the early universe is. If you have a symmetry breaking transition, uh, if you know what the model is, we know what the symmetry breaking transition is. But at least I wasn't wasn't clear to me that anyone really knows what the model is. So whether it has a Mexican hat potential, or it looks like the surface of a sphere, or, or uh, it, that it would depend on the details of the model. I'm not sure if that's something that uh, has been worked out. Yeah, so I, so I agree. I guess if it's a, um, so one thing, um, I'm trying to pull up some more data to show you. One thing that's um, for sure is if it's, a, if you want to so a Mexican hat, then you'll get strings. Um, I'm not sure from the surface of a sphere, whether you'd still get strings or it would be a different, um, a different, different. Um, and then you'd get points. Yeah, you get points, points. yeah. Yeah. Um, so your question about, so I'd say we, we have insufficient data to really know exactly how the strings are looking through the material. There's been some beautiful experiments done recently with a technique called coherent Bragg scattering on nanoparticles, which actually allows image, three-dimensional imaging of the strain field associated with the string. And these are not published, but I've, I've seen them, and, and they and they show that they do seem to wander around a lot. But your point about the um, electrostatics is a really interesting one because I, my poor little laptop can't cope with running Zoom and finding these data to show you. But um, there are measurements um, from the group of Dennis Meyer, actually at NTNU, which is hosting us today, of um, using um, so basically with scanning probe measurements looking down the side of the, um, so simultaneous piezo force microscopy and scanning probe looking at the side faces where, um, so where the polarization is, is pointing up and down and he's looking at the side. And what he sees are regions, so he, he, he sees certainly domain walls between these head to head and, and tail to tail, um, tail to tail domains, which is extremely um, unusual for ferroelectric. Yeah. And he also sees when he then looks with conducting AFM that, let me get it the right way around. So the head to head, so the material's a little bit native P type. So the head to head walls are very strongly conducting because the carriers all go to screen, no, the tail to tail are strongly conducting because the carriers go to screen the um, divergent electrostatic potential. And the head to head walls are depleted of any background carriers, again, to, to try to screen these, to these domain walls. So it seems that the domain structure is quite isotropic, which again is very surprising. Um, and I think it's because, well, the reason that it, it doesn't frantically avoid making head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail -tail domain walls is because the polarization is a secondary order parameter 
that's only at, at the phase transition is only just starting to emerge. It's not the, the struct the structure of the domains is set by a non-polar primary order parameter. Then the polarization emerges and it's stuck. So it it it's not that the the ferroelectric domains are not set by the usual mechanism of minimizing the depolarizing field. Um, they're locked in. So this unfavorable electrostatics gets locked into the structure against its will, if you like. And the system responds by having to put carriers there. Like this um, famous lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate interface. It's really the same physics at the, the domain walls that are, that are locked in. Um, now I forgot what your question was. Um, no, did I answer it? Okay, so, very good. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much. So this has been uh, this was the last question of the day. I see there are many other questions and comments on the chat, but I thank everyone for this interest and attending the talk. And I hope you guys can just email Nicola directly and set up for the discussion. So thank you very much, Nicola, for this exciting yeah. talk and this very nice discussions. And we enjoy it a lot. And hope everyone else did. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and yeah. while we are calling this uh, end to this colloquium, I want to point out that in the next colloquium when you register, which will be open soon enough, there will be an option to request discussion with the speaker after the colloquium. So please uh, <laughs> make use of that opportunity. So we are going to have these discussions. So thank you very much again. So Thank you, Rakesh. And maybe if um, whoever the host is can um, send me the chat afterwards, because I can't, can't see it. But I think you, when, you, when we end the meeting, the host gets sent the chat, I think. So maybe you could send it to me. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Babak, right? Yeah, yeah, I can share it with you. Good. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. Have a nice evening or a nice day. Or <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.